This week on EM and 5, we're going to talk about high altitude illness, and specifically these three acute mountain sickness, high altitude cerebral edema, and high altitude pulmonary edema. So let's review what makes up high altitude. So anywhere between 5,000 feet and 11,500 is considered high altitude. This is where you start to see decreased exercise tolerance and an increased ventilation at rest. An altitude illness can start occurring pretty commonly anywhere above 8,500 feet, especially if there's a rapid ascent. The next category is very high altitude, which is up to 8,000 feet. This is where you see a decrease in the oxygen saturation routinely below 90%, and above that is extreme high altitudes. Now to compare this to some peaks, we have Denver down at 5,000 feet, then some of the peaks in the continental U.S. up to Mount Whitney at 14,000 feet, and you can compare that to Mount Denali in Alaska, which is 20,000, but that's nothing compared to some of the international peaks. For example, Everest is way up there at 29,000 thousand feet so pretty incredible so of these three acute mountain sickness and haste these two are on the same spectrum with acute mountain sickness being the less severe now acute mountain sickness is caused from the lack of oxygen at high altitudes although the exact mechanism is really unknown and it can kind of be thought of the hangover of the high altitude illnesses and it's basically characterized by everything you'd expect from a serious night of partying you're going to have a headache loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and you don't have to climb Mount Everest to experience acute mountain sickness. People can start developing symptoms at elevations of just 8,200 feet, which can easily be obtained in the U.S. uh, mountain climbing or skiing. And while very unpleasant, the nice thing is this isn't really life-threatening. The treatment, the number one thing you need to do is stop ascent and acclimate. Otherwise, you could actually develop worsening things like hape or haze. One medication you can try prescribing other than just Tylenol fluids is acetazolamide, and we'll talk about that in a second. If the symptoms are particularly severe, you could consider recommending descent for these patients. Oxygen or sometimes even steroids are helpful. So a lot of these symptoms are thought to be caused from this phenomenon called periodic breathing, which occurs while people are sleeping at altitude. And the patient has these alternating cycles of hyperpnea with rapid breathing and apnea, where they're not breathing, that occur throughout the entire night, and it's a result of this generalized hypoxic environment. And these cycles result in this kind of catching up, where your SpO2 rises and then falls back even lower than your baseline. And you can imagine if this occurs all night, you're going to wake up in the morning having the acute mountain sickness. And this is where the acetazolamide comes in. Acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, and it excretes sodium bicarb in the urine, which results in a metabolic acidosis. And this means that, as a result, your respiratory rate speeds up a little bit. So by giving your patient a medication that kind of speeds up their breathing, you allow them to have kind of more rapid, regular breaths all night long, and it prevents the periodic breathing and the hypoxia that results from it. So it can improve the symptoms or even prevent the symptoms of AMS. Now, we said that there was a spectrum here, and haste, high-altitude cerebral edema, is on the, the bad end of it. So this is where the hypoxia is significant enough that you have an increase in cerebral blood volume, which eventually leads to cerebral edema. And if we think of acute mountain sickness as kind of the hangover symptoms, haste is when the patient still seems drunk. So the big symptoms here to look for is that they're confused or altered, possibly have ataxic movements. And this is life-threatening, so the number one treatment here is to just send the patient. You can also try giving them steroids and make sure to give them oxygen. If their blood pressure is stable, you can consider giving Lasix to reduce the edema a little bit. And if their descent is going to be delayed at all, see if you have access to hyperbaric treatment. Now, there really aren't too many hyperbaric chambers up on a high-altitude mountain, so they've developed this really neat device, the Gamma Bag, that's essentially a portable hyperbaric chamber. It's a big, airtight bag, kind of like an oversized sleeping bag. The patient gets inside of it, and you inflate it with a pump right there on the mountain. And with a PSI of 2, you can actually simulate a descent of around 3,000 to 9,000 feet. So that can be significant and very life-saving for a patient while waiting for evacuation. Okay, let's talk about the last one. This is HAPE, high altitude pulmonary edema, and it's very much the same as haste, just it happens in the lungs. So the hypoxia causes increased pulmonary artery pressure, which leads to capillary congestion and then pulmonary edema. And these symptoms, patients are going to have a decreased exercise tolerance, be getting very short of breath. They can become tachypnic, tachycardic, potentially have a cough. And on exam, you're going to hear lung crackles and rails. Again, this is life-threatening. You need to descend the patient. That's the number one treatment. Make sure you also give oxygen, which reduces the pulmonary artery pressure, and you can consider something like nifedipine, which will also reduce that pressure. If you have it available, consider giving them CPAP. And again, if the descent is going to be delayed at all, see if you have access to one of those portable hyperbaric chambers, the gamma bag.
Okay, so these are the big three of high-altitude illness, but I figured I should mention one more, kind of in jest, but it has real symptoms. It's called HAFE, high-altitude flatulence expulsion. Basically, people at altitude get a little gassy, and it's because gas expands at altitude um, because of the reduced pressure. So for example, if you're at a western U.S. peak around 8,000 feet, or in an airplane, 8,000 feet is actually the simulated altitude in an airplane, the gas is gonna expand in your intestines and anywhere else in your body up to 1.4 times. In Alaska, say you're at a peak out there, 15,000 feet, it expands up to two times. And the poor people who are climbing Everest as if they don't have enough problems, that gas expands four times the amount. So that's a review of the high altitude illnesses. Make sure you watch out for signs of cerebral edema or pulmonary edema. Those are life-threatening and you need to descend the patient. Here's some references, and thanks for joining us on EM in 5.